is what we're seeing in the hardest hit place in the world, which is in Europe. In Europe, uh, there is something like 160,000 real ex deaths in the last 10 weeks. And that's about three weeks of normal death in the area covered, maybe a little bit over, maybe 3.2 weeks. I felt that those estimates are good. Uh, you know, people have said, well, the numbers in Europe were very low because they controlled the epidemic so well. But I remember the pictures of Italy and Sweden and the, Belgium and parts of England where it didn't look so well controlled. So my argument was is that this really was following the Diamond Princess. And if you did nothing as sweet, well, you did very little. Uh, you weren't going to get more than uh, a fatality ratio, a population. Population fertility ratio that ends up being something like 500 per million. Uh, I think in Europe it's 470 per million. Sweden right now is 370 per million. And this, I think, seems to be the level at which, even if you do nothing, you can't get people infected more than that. This turns out to be just a little bit more, maybe 20% higher than the population fatality ratio that was seen for the 2017-2018 influenza in exactly the same European zone. So I'm comparing COVID in Europe with influenza on the same population, and the number for COVID is about 20% more. Now, these are not reported deaths. These are actual excess deaths, because in many countries that have done lockdown, uh, the number of excess deaths has actually gone down. So, uh, you know, th there's been a small number of deaths from COVID, but if you lock your country down uh, in the short term, you actually save lives. So that was my logic. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't believe in confrontation. I, I feel uh, a little bit sorry for Neil Ferguson because probably people listen to him too much. Um, you know, these models are subject to all kinds of issues. Although I do think he could have perhaps paid a little bit more attention to what I wrote to him, at least looked at it and said, well, maybe this is a scientific trick. I think one problem, uh, a general problem we have with epidemiologists is if I tell you there'll be a million deaths in Australia, and then I say, oops, sorry, with your, uh, with your lockdown, there'll only be a thousand deaths, everyone thinks it's fine. But if I say, you know, I don't believe there's going to be more than... 800 deaths, and then there's a 1,000 deaths. So I think in epidemiology, they sort of feel that scaring is a good idea. And I think in, I'm sure they're very surprised that their advice was taken because Neil Ferguson and the World Health Organization uh, has put out scares about Ebola, scares about bird flu that was similarly exaggerated. And then nothing happened. No one locked down, and everyone felt that they had done their job okay. So in some ways, um, and maybe this is a, a logical description of what's really going on. I personally, as a number scientist, feel that a 10% error is equally bad if you're too small or too big. And, and uh, it's not right to forgive a huge error and then say, oh, well, you listen to what I said. Um, so, you know, I think the... And the reason it's not fair is that the lockdown costs something. If a lockdown was completely free in terms of economy, in terms of social impact, in terms of uh, uh, education for children, uh, then it would be fine. But a lockdown, unfortunately, in this global world has massive consequences in all of those areas. And of course, there's another consequence I haven't even mentioned, which is delayed medical treatment. Um, everyone said that hospitals were going to be. Uh, overflowing with COVID cases, they weren't. Uh, but as a result, nobody who had a heart problem, a uh, cancer treatment, actually went to hospital. So we now have people who have uh, neglected their important medical treatment for two months. Uh, it's going to be interesting what's going to happen. I don't really know. The you know, If you believe that those people have been put in, in harm's way by doing this, we should see a secondary peak in excess deaths. It may not be so. It may turn out that uh, being locked down and having the excitement is actually quite good at present, you know, preventing lots of other illnesses. Uh, we don't know that yet. This is a, a speculation and I'm making somewhat uh, as a joke. <laughs> well, it's certainly a hydra-headed monster because there's it's no doubt about it. The, 
it's highly complex. I mean, road deaths are down, all sorts of other deaths are down, excess deaths, as you say, yeah. uh, are, are down because of this. But uh, my goodness, certain segments of the community are paying a very high price for it. If you take our own country, the people who have lost their jobs, for example, are in the private sector. Uh, they're the yeah. ones who generate the money for the people who are in the public sector. So there has yeah. been an inclination in the public sector to want to go harder on the lockdown. But the people who pay the price for the lockdown in economic terms and so forth with their jobs are those in the private sector, in the business world, and the jobs that depend on business in the private sector. So it's incredibly complex. But to come to this issue uh, of, um, if you like, if I can put it this way, some of the deaths really essentially being deaths that are brought forward because of underlying conditions or of demographic yeah. factors such as age. Your own analysis coming out of Europe is quite fascinating. As I understand it, it shows that only 8% of coronavirus or C-19 deaths were of people aged below 65 and 50% were of people 85 and over. Uh, disproportionately, even in that age bracket, uh, I suspect uh, males. Um, those who have been paying a close attention to this debate will have heard this point being made about those who die of COVID-19 and those who die with it. Yeah. How do we understand this and why is it important? Well, I think that um, I should also say that those same age rate deaths also applied to the influenza outbreak of 2017-18. So the, it, it, if you had, oftentimes you, know, oftentimes you can characterize the disease by how it affects age groups. But in this particular case, COVID and influenza uh, had a very, very similar effect on age groups. Another very important thing is, is that flu is seasonal. It occurs in the winter, but it doesn't occur every year. And if you actually look at the uh, European data, there was severe flu in 1718, much milder flu in uh, 1819, and no flu in 1920. So, I mean, in the year 2019-2020, which means that people who uh, perhaps would have uh, not survived a severe flu in the winter that we just passed were actually alive. But there also seems to have been here a national, a worldwide desire to try to maximize how many deaths each country had from COVID. Uh, quite the opposite of what you'd imagine they should be doing. Um, I saw this very, very clearly in Israel where I've been. Uh, I actually got into trouble here because I said very early on, I'd be surprised if there were more than 10 deaths. And then when the number got uh, you know, to 10 and 20 and so on, I got some very, very unpleasant emails that eventually ended up at being 300. But in Israel, the actual excess deaths or about 300 below what they should have been in a normal year. So, you know, was the death rate from COVID plus 300 or minus 300? And the trouble is, is that the, the, there's this issue of dying with and from, but there's also this issue of, since the same people who are dying from COVID are exactly the same people who die naturally. And I want to actually check this in the Eurozone, you know, are 8% of the natural deaths also below 65? Because if we're, if the, and 85 and half the deaths over 85 are also natural. If we're dying from exactly the same cohorts who die naturally, then if I die from COVID this week, I can't die naturally next week. I mean, an excess death is great because you only count each death. But if you're counting specific COVID deaths, you may count people for whom you're just uh, you know, slightly bringing forward their date of death. So all of these are, are, are very interesting complicated questions, something which I didn't anticipate, but I heard this from uh, doctors in the United States, is that there are actually good reasons there to say that somebody died of COVID rather than say of cancer or a heart attack. And basically uh, the reimbursement that a hospital gets for a patient, uh, if you have a patient who basically has pneumonia, which is very similar to the way you die in, in, in COVID, um, and you say they died of pneumonia, you get much less of a rate if you say they died from COVID. And apparently, if you also put that person on a vent, you even get an ex extra money for that. Um, but it goes much beyond the United States. I think everywhere they've tried to emphasize number of deaths, uh, 
very, they often mention the uh, pre-existing conditions, but you know, I, in, is, in Israel, the median age of people dying is over 85. In fact, everywhere in Europe, it's 85, because if half the deaths are over 85, and by definition, the median is 85. Um, and these are people who have other conditions as well. So instead of emphasizing um, that these are deaths which are probably natural deaths, they decided to rather emphasize the, the COVIDness of their deaths. And this, I think, is, is true everywhere. The New York Times recently had a front page with all the 100,000 names of the COVID deaths. Now, in the same period, uh, there were another 700,000 non-COVID deaths of exactly the same age group. Nobody really dies naturally. Everyone dies of something. You know, you have a stroke, you have a heart attack, you get pneumonia, you have a fall. I mean, you know, even if you die in your sleep, it's probably because something happened. And I sort of felt it was not really fair. But why should the people, you know, who died from COVID be decorated like this, where the people who died naturally or not from COVID shouldn't be? So there are lots of issues here. Um, but I'm still very surprised that... Uh, there was this tendency to want to emphasize COVID numbers as if it was an Olympic Games to see who had most COVID cases. I, I don't understand this at all. It's also very counterproductive because it means that in a country like Australia or Israel, um, the epidemic was stopped at very, very low infection rates. And therefore, there may be vulnerability to second waves. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.